an opportunity for me to have this, this chance to speak to you about the Christian faith. It's a perfect topic for me because I love the Christian faith. And over the last 50 years of my life, I've really come to love God. And I've, I've had the privilege of seeing God work in my life and work through me and work in the lives of so many other people that I'm truly inspired and encouraged and strengthened by my Christian faith in so many ways. And this is why I'm very happy to be able to talk to you, both from an academic point of view, intellectual point of view, but also from a personal point of view tonight. And my, my, my lecture tonight is going to start out with a, a personal story about how my life was changed uh, years ago. And, and then I'm going to talk about, as I said before, the importance of the Christian faith and some of the other, other aspects that I've already outlined for you. So let me tell you a little bit about my personal story. I grew up in a Christian home. What that means is that my mother and father uh, were Christians, my grandparents were Christians, my aunt was, was a Christian. And so I knew all about Jesus and about the Bible since I was a very, very little boy. But, but part of my life was very difficult. And the hardest part of my early years growing up was my relationship with my father. My father was a good man. He provided for our family, but he did not know how to relate to children. He didn't know how to show his love to me. He didn't know how to communicate love to me. And he had a problem. He had an anger problem. And so sometimes my father would get very angry at me. I uh, was just a little boy, but he get angry at me if I broke something or knocked something over. And sometimes he hit me. But well, for a little boy who's sensitive, to be hit by his father is very frightening and it's very disturbing. And so I grew up feeling a great loneliness for my father and a great loneliness in life in general. And so by the time I became a teenager, I became rebellious. And I began looking for other ways to find love, other ways to find meaning, and other ways just to enjoy life. And so I began smoking cigarettes at a very early age, seventh grade. I was the class drunk by ninth grade, which is kind of unusual uh, because it's illegal to drink and everybody in my town could see what I was doing, but I would sneak out and I would get alcohol with some of my friends and I would drink and I'd go to school activities at night and one time I almost fell off of these bleachers during a, a special gymnastics uh, program. Uh, because I had had too much to drink. But I loved drinking, and I loved playing with my friends, and I didn't want to change. But something inside of me was wrong, and I knew it. Something was still empty. And even though I had lots of fun, I also had lots of loneliness. And one night in particular, I had an experience where I was supposed to go to church. And every, in our, in our town, every Sunday we went to church. We went in the morning, we went at night, we went on Wednesday night. Church was an important part of our family tradition. But we had a big church. and We could fit a thousand people in our church, which means this, that if my parents sat down in the first row and I was in the balcony, they couldn't see me. Better than that is, if they were in the first row and I wasn't there at all, they didn't know. And so I, I, many times, I, I, they would say, well, did you come to church? Yes, of course. I said, where were you sitting? On the balcony. I said, you couldn't see me? Uh, no, no, we couldn't see you. Oh, I could see you. Fortunately, they never asked me where they were, but I knew they always sat in the same place. <laughs> so anyway, on one Sunday night, I was at home by myself. They, they already went to church. I was supposed to follow, and I was sitting, we had a, an outdoor porch. I mean, it was covered, but it was open on the side. And I was sitting there smoking a cigarette. And I'm sure I thought I was pretty cool, because my father certainly would be very angry with me if he saw me smoking. But there they were, they were at church, I was at home, I was smoking. And it started raining, and I thought, I don't want to walk to church in the rain. But then I got this idea. I don't know why, 
But I said, Lord, if you make it stop raining, I'll go to church. <laughs> I'm looking out under my porch, you know, smoking my cigarette. So what do you think? Do you think it stopped raining? Yes or no? Yes. And I get both. Answer is no. No, it did not stop raining. Maybe it even started raining harder. I don't know. But, but the, the critical point was this. Right after I said that to God, I heard this voice in my head that said, who are you to give conditions to the Almighty God? And I just knew immediately that I was wrong to put conditions on God. I was wrong to say, well, God, if you do this, then maybe I'll follow you. But that was a rebellious heart. It was arrogant. It was prideful. And I knew immediately that I needed to go to church. And I threw down my cigarette and put it out on the ground and started walking to church, still hoping it would stop raining. Well, I walked, it was not that far, maybe, maybe one kilometer. And so I'm walking there and it doesn't stop raining. And finally I go into church and I sit in the very, very back row, downstairs. And I'm all wet, but I'm listening. But by the time I get there, it's just in time for the sermon. And the preacher is preaching this message. And he's saying, he's explaining to us that the Almighty God, the Creator, the Father of the entire human race, loves us and calls us to give our lives to Him and follow Him. And he said, I believe there's someone here tonight that God brought specifically to hear this message. And I knew that was me. There was no doubt in my mind that was me. And when I heard that message from God, I, I, from the preacher, I immediately took it as a message from God. And so that night I submitted my life to God. I said, God, may, may your will be done in my life. And that included being willing to follow Jesus Christ, his son. And from that moment on, my life was different. Now, I didn't become perfect. I'm still not perfect. Far from perfect. But my life really did change. How? How does submitting to yourself to God change you? It changes your attitude. Because suddenly, I, instead of trying to just please myself, I realized I want to please God. I want to do what God wants me to do. And suddenly my life had a meaning and a purpose that came from my Creator. And I wanted to discover, what is that? What is God's purpose for me? What am I supposed to do with my life? And so I began a journey of, of seeking God. That means reading the Bible, going to Bible study, praying, going on mission trips, uh, learning, studying, trying to, to grow in my relationship with God. Because I wanted to find out, what does God want me to know? What does God want me to do? Well, over time, I, I went on to a Christian college, and I learned more and more about spirituality and about how to relate to God. And I just felt myself feeling stronger and, and more full. I felt less lonely. I felt more complete. I felt more joy, and it, and it was a good kind of joy. It wasn't the, the, the funny laughing from being drunk and falling over with my friends kind of fun. It was a joy that just felt clean and pure and, and full of life. And I had many, many opportunities just to experience that week after week. And I felt that God was calling me to become a pastor of a church. So I went on to theology school, and I became a pastor of a church. Then I went on and got more education so I could become a teacher. And for 10 years, I worked with a ministry to at-risk youth. These are kids that are in trouble with their parents or with the school or with the, the police. And then finally, about 12 or 13 years ago, we began Faith, Hope, and Love Global Ministries, which is what we've been talking about tonight. And, and ever since that, for all those years, uh, I've experienced more and more growth, more and more knowledge, more and more experience with God. But the main thing I want to emphasize to you is this. 
I am where I am today because of what happened about 50 years ago on a rainy Sunday night. It was the night God called me by His Spirit. And it was the, the night I said yes to God. And that has changed the whole course of my life. That's my personal story. And so now I want to back off, back away from my personal story to talk more broadly about what is the God's story that we find in the Bible? What is the message that doesn't just apply to me, but is at the heart of the Christian faith? So that it invites everyone who believes in God, who believes in Jesus Christ, that they too can have this kind of experience in, in various forms. So let's begin by talking about the core messages of the Christian faith. The core messages of the Christian faith. And we'll begin with uh, two of the most famous verses in the entire Bible, John 3, 16 and 17. And I invite you to read these with me, if you can read this. So, wait a second. Uh, I've got this one ahead. Wait, 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 come on there. Okay, now. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. All right. How many of you have heard of that first verse, John 3.16, before? Raise your hand. Uh, I'd say that's at least two-thirds of you. All right? But this is the most famous verse in the Christian faith, John 3.16. So we're going to take a few minutes now just to look at some of the key words in this verse to go deeper, to help you understand what the Bible writers really mean. You know, and I should have said this to you, that in the Christian faith, the Bible is extremely important. For the Buddhists, they have the Dhamma, right? For the Christians, we have the Bible. And the Hindus have the Vedas. And for, for the Muslims have the Quran. So every major religion has their holy book. So what I'm going to be sharing with you now, now that I've finished telling you my personal story, is, is I'm going to tell you about the Christian faith from what we find in our, our holy book, Christian holy book, the Bible. But some of the, for some of you, especially if you're not from the Christian faith, you may not really know exactly what is meant by some of these terms. So let's start out with just the basic idea of God. Who is God according to the Christian faith? What did you say? Yeah, they're very good at the creator. In the Christian faith, God is known first and foremost as the creator. And so... In other religions, such as Hinduism, there are millions of gods. And so there are different ideas about gods. But in the Christian faith, there's only one God. And that God is the creator God. Why is that so important? Because when we look to God as the creator, we honor him as the one who brought this world into existence. We see the, the moon, the sun, the stars. We see the... the the human being, the life of human life, we see the animal life, the insects, the birds, the fish, everything that's really interesting and magnificent throughout all of the, of the universe is created by the Creator. And so that's the starting place. When we say God, that's what we're talking about. But there's another part about, about the Creator God that I want to emphasize. And that is, we also call God Father. Father. Why? Because we recognize Him as the one who loves us as a, as a human father would love a child, but even more. And as our Creator, just like a, a child comes from a mother and father who come together to have a baby, so the Creator of the universe, the Creator of the human race, the one who made humans with the, the ability to make babies is the father of the human race. 
When I think about God as the creator of the stars and the moon and all of all the things I see in the world, I think, wow. Oh, very cool. Some pretty amazing things in the world. But when I also think about God as Father, I think about him as, as someone with whom I can have a relationship. Somebody who wants to have a relationship with me. And as I already told you my story, this was very important to me because I didn't have a close relationship with my own father. And so when I discovered that the Creator God wanted to love me like a father, that meant so very much to me. And that's what's meant so much to millions of people around the world. The second thing in this verse to emphasize is that God so loved the world. And so again, we should recognize that this God is not, is not like one of the gnats, for example, that we're afraid of, the spirits in the forest, that maybe we have to put some food out for fear that if we don't put out food, maybe they'll attack us or hurt us. The God that we read about in the Bible is a loving God. It's his desire to have a relationship with us and to bring us good, not evil. And that is a very, very important characteristic about God uh, that, that you need to understand if you want to understand what's so special about the Christian faith. Third, this verse says God so loved the world. In other words, the Christian message is not just for Christians. Well, we know there are many different religions in the world, many different ideas about truth and different ideas about wisdom. But from a Christian perspective, the Christian message is for the whole world. Anyone who wants to have a relationship with their loving creator God can have that relationship. No matter what your background, no matter what your religion, if you want a relationship with God the Father, it's available because God loves the whole world. That's what this verse is saying. And then next, it says that he gave, one of the ways he showed his love is that he gave his one and only son. Well, this is something that's very hard to understand, especially for people outside of the Christian faith. But according to Christian teaching, we believe that, that God the Father decided that, that the human beings needed a better way to know who he was. And that the best way that he could reveal himself to us was to actually become a human being. Now, we don't know how that happens. I mean, there are stories in the Bible, but you and I can't understand that. It's just, it's a basic teaching that says God found an incredible, miraculous way to show us what he's like by becoming a human being, and his name was Jesus. We now call him Jesus Christ, because Christ is, stands for Messiah, or the one that, that was promised to be the savior of the world. And so this Jesus Christ helps us know what God is like. And so we read in the Bible his teachings, how he lived his life. But the best, the most important way that God reveals himself in Jesus is in a very surprising way. Do you know how, what that way is? What did Jesus do that surprised other people that actually tells us about God? He died. He said, well, everybody dies. Yeah, but not like Jesus died. Jesus was crucified. Jesus stood up against injustice. Jesus stood up for the poor. He stood up for the people who were being oppressed. Jesus is my greatest hero, without a doubt. Because he was someone who had the courage to stand up against the religious authorities and against implied even the Roman authorities. And to say, we must treat people right. We must care about them. We must care for their needs. And yes, we'll give them religious teaching. We'll tell them what God requires. But we must help them. We must encourage them. And for the widows and the orphans, we must, we must help provide extra help for them. That's what Jesus taught. And, and, and he accused the religious leaders of hypocrisy. He accused them of, of not caring about the people. And so they wanted to kill him. And he did. And so ultimately, what we see by that story in retrospect, by looking back, is that we realize 
that Jesus was showing us the character of God. God is someone who cares about the person who's suffering. God is willing to extend himself sacrificially for the sake of the people who are hurting and need him. So much so that instead of protecting himself, Jesus was willing to go to the cross. He died on the cross, which is a horrible, horrible death, embarrassing, humiliating, painful death in ancient Rome. But God used that horrible experience to bring us life, to help us believe that God really is loving, God really does care, and that he died when he died, and then he came back to life, we call that resurrection, we realize there's hope. There's hope beyond this world of sadness, of oppression, of, of destruction, of suffering. And so Jesus becomes a great symbol of hope, a symbol of God's love and a means by which those who believe in him can also experience this life. And so this is all what it means when we say God, God gave his son. He really gave himself in the form of his son to die for us. And then the next part is whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. Salvation means this in the Christian faith. It means that our sins, sins are what we do wrong. The things that we do against uh, the will of God. In the Buddhist tradition, we they talk about the desires that we have that produce suffering. The Christians have a very similar idea. We call it sin. We have another name for it. But the idea is that is our desires to serve ourselves or to exploit other people or to hurt other people, those, those desires, those, the greed, the, the lust, the, the selfishness, all of that produces suffering for us and other people. So here, Buddhists and Christians are very similar in our diagnosis of the human condition and the problem. And so salvation, though, in the Christian tradition is God's provision of forgiveness for us. Because according to the teaching of Scripture, which our the Christian Bible, is if I don't experience forgiveness, I'm not free to live a better life. I can try hard to live a better life, but if, when I experience forgiveness, I suddenly feel free. And I feel hope again. I feel peace. And then I have no strength. That in that strength, I can do good things in the world. And that's the Christian way towards salvation, the Christian way of hope. We still suffer in this life, but God brings us relief from our guilt and shame through this forgiveness. And then this idea of eternal life, which is all, we're still in the same first verse. Eternal life means this, two things. It's a quality of life, and it's a quantity of life. The quality of life is now we have a relationship with our Creator God who loves us and forgives us. And His presence in our life helps us to live better lives. Quantity of life means this life goes on forever. The Christian faith does not believe in, in karma and in, in the wheel of karma and reincarnation. That's one of the differences. Instead, we believe that everybody dies I think you do too. Everybody believes that, I hope. You know that. We all die, but then what happens after death? Well, nobody knows, right? For sure. Because you haven't been dead and come back and tell us. Tell us. I haven't either. So these different religions have different ideas about what happens. Well, for the Christians, the Christian according to the teaching of the Bible, the Judeo-Christian tradition, Jewish Christian tradition, we believe that at the end of our lives, we're judged by God. Our Creator God has a right to judge us, and He does. But those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ are forgiven. And they will, they will spend eternity, that means forever and ever, with God in heaven. So the relationship that begins now with a loving Father goes on forever. That's the Christian message. That's what eternal life means in the Christian faith. And then, finally, in verse 17, I want to emphasize these words. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world. 
You know, we can talk a long time about what it means to save the world. And I think you know very, world, very well the world needs saving, right? We're, we're, we're destroying ourselves. We've got serious climate issues. We have serious uh, political issues, social issues. It seems like human beings over and over again keep making choices to bring destruction on themselves and other people. That's the world we live in. And so the world needs saving. And in the end, we're going to have to decide how the world's going to be saved, if it's going to be saved. But according to the Christian tradition, salvation begins and ends with a relationship with God. And when we have a right relationship with God, we're forgiven, we're, our, our attitudes are different, we have a, a different perspective on life, then we're ready to try to make the world a better place. But no matter whether we succeed or we fail, our ultimate hope is that God will save us from this world of decay. And ultimately, God will rescue us from the death that comes to all human beings. That's why Jesus came. All right, that's John 3, 16 and 17. Now we're going to look at three more verses, and we're talking about the core messages of the Christian faith. These verses are taken from the Apostle Paul's letter. He's one of the early Christian missionaries and one of the early Christian leaders and teachers. One of the most famous in the first century. And he wrote a letter to a group of people in a town called Ephesus. And the letter that he wrote is called Ephesians. And in this letter we find these three verses. So read them with me, please. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourself, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. All right, again, I'm going to emphasize a few of the important words. When this great teacher uh, Paul, Saint of Paul, we could call him today. When this great teacher from the first century looked at the world and he saw all the different religions and all the different ideas about how people were trying to please God, how they were trying to have a better life, how they were trying to improve themselves. One of the things he, he realized is that there were, most people think that they have to do it themselves. They have to earn their salvation. They have to earn God's favor. They have to earn whatever it is they're going to gain. But that's normal, right? Because if you want a good grade in your class, the teacher's not gonna just give it to you unless you pay them enough money. I'm joking, I hope you don't pay them money. Okay, no, you have to earn it, right? You have to earn your grades. If you want a good job, you have to prove that you're good enough to have a good job when you graduate. That's how the world works. Unfortunately, many of you have grown up in families, and I know this from experience, where, where you've had to earn your parents' love. Or you might think you have to earn it. And if you don't obey, you don't do what they're, they're, they tell you to do, you may feel that they might stop loving you. And so everywhere in society is this, it, there is this mentality that I have to do it myself. I have to earn my own way to get ahead. But the Apostle Paul says he understands why we all think that way. But he says it won't work. It won't work with God. It's not possible. You and I cannot be good enough to please God. We can't work our way to God. Let's say this is God's perfect standard up here. And these are human beings down here. And let's say there are some, some of you that are you know, better than the bottom. And I think maybe many of you think you are better than the bottom. Maybe you're up here. Maybe you're this good. And maybe you know some people that are this good. You say, oh, they're really good people. 
And some are maybe really, really, really good people. And I know that's how a lot of people feel about Aung San Suu Kyi and some of the other people in your own history here that you look back on and you say, those are great people or still are great people. But what the Bible teaches, and so does the Dhamma, frankly, the ultimate standard for goodness is above even the greatest person. That no matter how good you are on this scale, and now from a Christian point of view, God's standard is still higher. So you could try really, really, really hard and be good, very good, very, very, very good, but you're still going to sin. You're still going to make mistakes. You're still going to do things that are wrong, right? Can you admit that? Every one of us does things that are wrong. Whether people know or not, you know that inside of your own heart there are evil desires. And sometimes you do things that are wrong. And so Paul says this whole idea of earning our salvation is impossible. So give it up. There's an alternative. And that alternative is in this word, grace. Grace. Grace is when God gives us something we don't deserve. Grace means God gives us a gift that we can't pay back. It comes out of his love. It comes out of his desire to forgive us, his desire to make us better people, his desire to be in relationship with us. That's grace. That's graciousness. And some people don't like that message. Why? Because they're proud. And they say, I want to do it myself. I don't want to trust in anybody else. I don't need a savior. I don't want a savior. I want to do it myself. Well, you can think that way if you want, but it's going to come to an end because you can't do it. You can only go so far. And maybe you'll be the greatest person in this class. I hope you are. Well, I hope somebody is, right? I hope, hope that you're the, you become the greatest people in Myanmar. I'd love that. That'd be fabulous. But you can't be good enough to meet God's perfect standard. And that's why we have to give up that system in exchange for a system of grace. And so the second word in this verse, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved, saved from yourself, forgiven for your sins, given the hope of eternal life. That's what saved means. You have been saved through faith. So what does faith mean in the Christian tradition? What do you think? What does faith mean? Anybody want to take a, take a guess? Yeah, it just means believe. You have to believe. Well, but what do you have to believe? You have to believe the whole Bible? No. So as soon as you memorize the Bible and believe it, then you're good. No. You have to believe in the message. You have to believe in what we call the gospel. Maybe you've heard that term gospel. Gospel means good news. What's the good news? The good news is that God loves you and God offers you forgiveness through his grace. That's the good news. And that, there's, and that he proved his love by sending Jesus Christ to die for you and be your savior. If you believe it, that's faith. If you trust it, that's faith. Some of you might be scratching your head and say, that, that's kind of simple, isn't it? Yeah, it's really simple. Because you and I are that simple. We need something simple in order to be able to be changed by God. Any of you have ever fallen in love before? Any of you have boyfriend, girlfriend? No, not yet. Well, when you do fall in love, believe me, you'll know the difference. Because one, one day you see, you see this beautiful girl, or if you're a girl, you see a good looking guy, and, and maybe, maybe you think they're, they're really cute or something. But then one day you get to know them, and it's more than just beauty or attraction. But you think, ah, oh, I want to be with that person. You fall in love. And it's actually quite simple, right? For, for, at first, this other person is just, just a body walking around the street like hundreds of others of you here. But then all of a sudden, that person becomes special to you. Well, that's how it is with God. 
It's not complicated. It's simple. But until you know God, God is just an idea, just one more God of the millions of gods in the world, another religion, lots of religions. But once you really see God for who he is, a loving father, and you recognize that Jesus Christ is, is how we know who God is, it's God's son. And suddenly, you believe that God loves you personally. And you accept that in your heart. It's suddenly all different. It's all different. And that's faith. And that's what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about this movement from trying to earn your own salvation, working hard, trying to prove things, do it on your own, to finally just trusting in the grace of God through faith. And then, to make it really clear, he adds this point. And by the way, he says, this is not by works so that no one can boast. Why does he add that? Because he knows that you and I are the same. We want to boast. We all want to be really proud of, of our accomplishments. And so we would love to be able to, to say, yes, I earned God's love. I earned my salvation. I, I'm a good man. I'm a good woman. I'm a, I'm a great success because I did it. Now, maybe in the Asian culture, it's not polite to say that, but you might feel it and think it anyway in your own mind. So Paul wants to say, let me be really, really, really clear. This salvation that comes from, from God is by grace, through faith, and is not of anything you did. Nothing. Nothing. And there's something really beautiful about that. Because it's freeing. It's freeing. Because if you say, I have to do some works in order to be saved by God, then immediately the next question is, how many works? How much work? Is it this much work? This much? This much? And you could go your whole life doing more and more and more without ever being sure if God really loves you or whether you're saved. So Paul just says, move it aside. Move it aside. Salvation is not by works, it's by grace through faith. So, I hope some of you might be wondering, well, then what about good works? You know, is there still a place for works? Well, that's the next verse. All right, two things he says here that I want to emphasize. First of all, he says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So in other words, the one who works is God. God is the work, the worker, and we are the workmanship. Well, what is a workmanship? This table is a, is a workmanship of a carpenter. All right. This microphone is the, the workmanship of somebody who can create a microphone. This building is the workmanship of a worker who is a builder. And so, what this verse is saying is that when you Really put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God works in you to make something beautiful of your life. You're, you're something that he is creating. Now, he already started the work, right? Because you're alive. You already have many beautiful qualities. As, I, as we used to teach in my, the program we ran for, for 10 years, we told the kids every single time they came to youth group, said, don't forget you're lovable, capable, and worthwhile. Because that's how God made you. You're, you're lovable in God's eyes. You are capable in God's eyes. You're worthwhile. You're a valuable person. That's true. But in order for, for God to continue his good work in your life, you have to cooperate. You have to go along with his, his leading. You have to accept his grace by faith. And it all comes through Christ Jesus. Or Jesus Christ. It's just another way of saying Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, the same thing. And what this is really saying is that when we have this relationship with Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, God's work continues in you to bring you salvation, to bring you this new life that we're talking about. And what is what does this new life look like? And maybe someone should go go there and ask them to postpone singing. Uh, for we are God's workmanship, creating Christ Jesus to do what? 
What's it say? Yeah, good works. Good work. So now, here is where good works comes in. Here is where good works come in. So in other words, every one of you is called by God to do good works in the world. But you have to know what the proper place is for those good works. They're not first, they're second. First is putting your faith in God through Jesus Christ. And then when God works in your heart, he forgives you, he helps you, he changes you, he relieves you, he gives you peace. Then you have something inside of you to offer other people. And then you begin to offer that, and those are the good works that God wants you to do. Not to earn your salvation, but to live the life God created for you to live. So, that is the overview of the core Christian messages. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a 10 minute break and just get up, move around, whatever you want to do. But please be back. See that clock up there? Please be back by 10 after 6 and we'll start the next session. The core messages of the Christian faith. And a lot of that is intellectual. And it's very personal, but it's these are ideas. But now I want to talk more about the heart of the Christian faith. This is, these are all sort of ideas, but they touch our heart in, in a way that, that maybe goes beyond some of what we've been talking about already. The Christian faith, at the heart of the Christian faith, is love. In some places around the world, Christian faith is known as the religion of love. Not because Christians are perfect, by any means, but because love is a central message. It's a message about God's love. It's a message about God's desire that you and I become people of love. So love is, is absolutely central to the Christian message. And sometimes that gets lost. Sometimes it gets lost in our churches. Sometimes it gets lost in interfaith dialogue. And sometimes it gets lost in the villages. But we need to get back to, especially here where we're teaching you about the Christian faith, and what's so special about the faith, is to go back to the central concept, the central heart concept, and that is love. And there are two passages that I want to highlight here uh, that come from the Bible. Two sets of verses. The first is Matthew 22, 36 and 39 through 39. And I have put this on the screen here for us so that we can read these verses together. So somebody came to Jesus and they said together, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Does anybody know the answer? I think I heard somebody say it. Here it is. Jesus replied, get alone. Jesus, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. And so this is extremely important that to understand that your who you are and what you were created to be is all has to, has to do with this idea of love. But it's more than an idea of love, it's an experience of love. And the kind of love is a love that with your heart and your soul and your mind, your heart is that emotional part of you that, that desires to care and give to others or give to God or appreciates God and, and it just is, has fond feelings toward God or gratitude toward God for all that God does for you. That's what, especially in relation to this idea of forgiveness. And when I realized that no matter how many bad things I did, that when I put my faith in Jesus Christ and trusted him, that he forgave me, I feel a lot of love for God. I really appreciate the fact that he keeps giving me second chances. And that touches my heart. And I love him from my heart. But we're also called to love God from our soul. 
Well, what's a soul? Nobody really knows, right? Because you can't, it, it, back in the Middle Ages, they used to do autopsies. You know what that is? You cut into people. Well, you cut into somebody, you can look at their brain, you can look at their heart, you can look at their, their ribs, etc., their bones. And they also were looking for their soul. They couldn't find it. So the soul is, must be some kind of a, a metaphor. It's a, for our basic identity. That's how the Jewish people understood soul, nephesh in the Hebrew language. And it means that basic core of who we are. We're called to love God at our deepest, truest self, the point of ourselves. I can, I can like a lot of people. I can fall in love with a lot of people. I can feel, I can have a crush on a lot of people. But that doesn't mean I love them from my soul. To love someone from your soul is to, to give your life to that person. And to want to, to be in a relationship with that person that exceeds all other relationships. So we love God from our heart, love God from our soul, and he says, and love God with your mind. How do you love somebody with your mind? Any ideas? It means you have to think about it. A very simple definition of love is that when I act in a way that's in the best interest of somebody else. That's my favorite definition of love. Because it's thoughtful. When I look at somebody else and I say, well, what does that person need? What, what is, how would that person feel if I treat them this way or that way? And if I act in a way that's loving, thoughtful, I use my mind and treat them in a kind way that I'm loving them. It starts with my mind, but then it goes to action. So it doesn't stay with our mind, but it, then it goes to action. Well, how does that apply to God? I mean, I think it's easy to see how it applies to human beings. But God doesn't need anything from you. But God wants to have this loving relationship with you where you think about him. Most of us think about ourselves, think about the video games we're playing, maybe think about our classes, certainly think about our crushes. Uh, so we have certain things that occupy most of our attention. But God says, most of all, I want you to think about me. Now that's not instead of these other things. But he wants us to realize that your relationship with God is the most important relationship. In fact, it's the only relationship that's going to last forever. Everything else falls away at some point. And so to be thinking about what that relationship means, to be thinking about in my mind, what does God want for me? To believe that what God wants for you is the best, because he loves you, he wants the best for you. That's how he's thinking about you. If you train yourself to think about him, then you're putting your mind in sync with how he's thinking about you and about the world. And the more we can transform our mind, the more we can change the way we think, the more prepared we are to do good works in the world, to be positive contributors, to be good friends, to be good lovers, to be good husbands and wives and fathers and mothers, citizens. It starts up here, frankly. Our feelings go up and down, we change all the time. But our mind is what controls, really, how we look at the world and what we ultimately decide we're going to do, what's important. So another way of saying this is simply, we're called to love God with all of our being. All of me is supposed to love all of him. And that's the first and greatest commandment. Another way to think about that is to say, the most important thing for you to do for the rest of your life is to love God. Because if you do that, then the rest will all follow. He'll show you what to do. He'll show you how to live. So don't think that it means that you have to go to a monastery and live there the rest of your life. Or have to go live in a cave and just think about God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you, you develop this spiritual relationship with God that affects your mind and your heart and your soul and, and what you do. And so the decisions that you make will all grow out of this love. 
But then the second part, he said, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's your neighbor? Yeah, right. Each side of you, right? That's your closest neighbor. But really, it just means those all around you. And don't think it's just the people in your own ethnic group, or just the people in your own religion, or just the same, same pe people from the same village. And let's face it, we don't do a very good job loving even people that are in our own family. Right? We're, we're not very good at this as human beings. So that's why Jesus made it a command. He said the whole Old Testament, which was the scriptures of the Jewish people, he said, so when he says, uh, when he refers to commandments, he's thinking about the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament. But what he's, what he's doing is he's simplifying all of those teachings to say, listen, this is the most important thing. You love God, and you love other people, and you are doing what God wants you to do. That's the best way to orient your mind and your life. And this is a huge, huge, huge commandment. Easy to say, easy to agree with. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I want to be loving. But really hard to do most of the time. But then, no matter how hard or easy it is, it's still the truth. And Jesus said in another part of Scripture, which is recorded in another part of Scripture, Know the truth because the truth will set you free. And so part of your growth as a young adult is to learn the truth, the truth about God, the truth about life, and then order your life accordingly. And so these verses have become very important guides for Christians to know what is most important. And let me look at it, show you another verse. This is on the same subject, but this is taken from Again, the Apostle Paul. The first one is Jesus' teachings. But this is, again, the same uh, seah that I was talking about earlier. The seah Paul, in the first century, wrote these words of wisdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is his first letter to the Corinthian people. And in these three verses, he said this. Together, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding bone or a playing symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains and have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Okay, so what, what is the Apostle Paul saying here? It's just another way of saying what Jesus said. Love is the most important thing. Why does he need to emphasize it? Because once you make the decision to become a more religious person, to become a more spiritual person, once you decide that you care about God, you care about being a, a good person in the world, you want, you want to do good things, once you make that decision, then you have to ask the question, how do I do that? What should I do? And what, what was true in Paul's day is still true today. There are many people who try many different ways of trying to be holy people. And some people spend a, a lot of time just reading the Bible. Some people spend a lot of time meditating. Some people spend a lot of time serving. Or maybe they're working in development. Some people spend time in politics. Maybe they think that, or the best of them think that they can make this a better country by serving in politics. Other people create businesses. But people try different things to try to prove that they really care and they, they want to make a difference. But Paul noticed something. He, no he noticed that for some of these people, that some of them were, were very hard-working, very dedicated. I mean, some of them maybe could speak in tongues of angels, or whatever that is exactly. They could speak in another language, and they could impress other people. Some of them had a gift of prophecy where they could speak words of truth to the, to the people. And everybody admired them, and they, and they listened to all their words. Some of them had great faith. 
Some of them were very generous and gave so much to the poor. Some of them were actually martyrs. They were willing to die for their faith. All of those are good things. But he says, if you do those things, but you don't have love, you're nothing. You're nothing. It's all for naught. It's a waste, in other words. So this is Paul's way of saying, pretty graphically, that make sure you keep the first thing first. Love comes first, and then comes all the different ways you're going to serve. And that parallels what we talked about in the first session, right? God's love comes first. He calls us to have a relationship with him, a loving relationship with him through, by grace through faith. That's first, and then comes good works. Paul is saying love comes first, and then come the good works. Very, very important in understanding the Christian faith. This is, and I'm going to say it again at the end, this is one of the most important distinctives of the Christian faith. This is what makes it different from most other religions in the world. It's the priority of love. Now, unfortunately, many Christians have not gotten that message. Or we're just too weak. Or we grew up in traditional Christian churches. Some of you may be Christians because your parents are Christians. Your grandparents are Christians. Everybody in your village is a Christian. So you're a Christian. Well, it's the same thing for those of you who are Muslim. Those of you who are Muslim are Muslim probably because your parents are Muslims or your grandparents are Muslim. Same thing for those of you who are Buddhist. You're probably Buddhist because your parents and grandparents are Buddhist. That's normal. There are a few exceptions. But most of us adopt the religion of our parents. That's the starting place. It was the same thing in Paul's world. Same thing in Jesus' world. Most people adopt the religion of their parents. But what Jesus did for us, and so the Apostle Paul, the writer of the Bible, is to call us to go beyond just what we inherited from our parents. Go beyond tradition. To really think for yourself. To really develop a relationship with God for yourself. Whether it's your parents or not. And make it real. Real because, and what I mean by that, it's a real relationship. Your friends are your friends because you have, you spend time with them. Because you care about them and they care about you and you spend time doing things. If you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, there's something special, as I said, as I said many times, but you had to cultivate that relationship. It's not an idea. Oh, I believe in boyfriends and girlfriends. No, good. No, it's when I fall in love, all of a sudden everything's different. And so it is with God. It has to go beyond tradition, beyond ritual, beyond what everybody else is doing to become real. And the way it becomes real for you is by love, according to the Christian tradition. And where does all this love focus? What is God's intention around this? This is the concept I want to talk to you about. Is the concept of, of the sacred love flow. All right, this is something you may never have heard of before. The word sacred just means what? Holy. Sacred is something that's, that's unusual. It's something special. It's something that we treat with great honor. So it's a sacred and love. We've been talking about that. So the only other word that's left in here is flow. What does flow mean? What flows in the world? Water. Water flows more than anything else. And the idea of flowing water is a, good, is a, is a positive concept for us. I love waterfalls. How many of you like to see a waterfall? Yeah, I just see everybody, right? It just calls to us. Well, most of your body is water, right? If you've studied science, you know most of your body is water. And water speaks to us because there's life in water. We're nourished and refreshed by water. But there's also power in water. Well, we use water power to create electricity. Uh, but there's also beauty in water. I think this idea, uh, just thinking about the flow of water is a great symbol for spirituality for me. Because there's life, there's beauty, 
There's power. That's what spirituality is supposed to be. So let me say that again. For some of you, this is, this is radically different from what you inherited growing up. Because I know for some of you who grew up in traditional Christian homes, Christianity is a, is a way of ordering your village and your family, but you may not have experienced love, you may not have experienced beauty, you may not have experienced life, you may not have experienced power. And if you haven't experienced those things, it's not real for you yet in the way that God wants it to be real. So please hear what I'm saying. You are called by God to experience God in life-giving, powerful, beautiful ways. That's spirituality. And so your question and mine should always be, if we want that, is how do I get that? How do I experience that? Well, we've been talking about that already, but for now, what I mostly want to do is to stay with this image of the flow of the water as the image of the sacred love flow. God's idea about love is more than a commandment. You must do this. It's more than that. It's an idea that, that from somewhere there's this huge reservoir of water, or in our analogy of love, a great reservoir of love that is pouring forth into the world. And that is the love of God that's pouring forth to bring life and beauty and power into the world and to those who want to receive it and benefit from it. And God's intention is that we would be nourished by this. That we'd be filled with it. You just swim in it. You bathe in it. You drink it. You delight in it. You play in it. That's God's love. It's supposed to be that wonderful for you. And you receive it first. But then you're called to be part of keeping that flow going to the rest of the world. That's what I mean by this sacred love flow. It begins with God, it comes to you, and then it keeps going to the rest of the world. And so our calling as Christians, those of you who are Christians, or I should say the Christian call, is to first of all enter into this love flow and then to participate in it. It's another way of thinking about what your purpose is. Frankly, it may not matter whether when you graduate, you go to work for an NGO and make a lot of money, as some of you are dreaming about, or whether you go to your village and maybe you sacrifice your life and you're a teacher to try to help the people who have such poor education. Or maybe some of you desire to be a doctor or a lawyer or, or somebody who's a professional in society. Or some of you are just going to go home and you're gonna make a family and you're going to take care of your parents. You see, it really doesn't matter exactly what you do. What matters is whether or not you're part of the sacred love flow. Because if you know God's love, you have everything you need. And if you give that love to others, you are doing what God wants you to do. And what you do specifically, well, that's a whole other topic. And uh, maybe I'll talk to you about calling and vocation one day. Because that takes some thought. And preparation. But basically, at the core, love is what matters. That's the sacred love flow. Okay, uh, one more comment about that. This is, in some ways, an ideal. You know that word, ideal? I D E A L? Ideal. It's, it's an idea that is at the top of the list of all possible ideas. Ideas. Uh, it's an ideal. And in other words, we all struggle, even the, even the most sincere, most faithful, most dedicated, most humble person who wants this will still struggle with it. Because sometimes there are reasons why we, we can't perceive the love of God. Some of us have had difficult experiences with our parents, and we can't, we can't even imagine a loving God. Or some of us have been mistreated by, by people, religious people. And so we can't imagine that there can be love related to a religion, or the Christian faith. Others of us have just struggled with our own failures and our own sin. And we can't believe that God could ask us 
to be part of a sacred love world. Or maybe some of you have tried. You've tried to be a good person. You've tried to be a kind person, but you keep failing. That's, that's human life. And so that's why I say this is an ideal, and all of us fall short of it. But, but you have to have ideals. You have to have an idea in your mind that you, that you determine is the most important thing. It's a goal. It's what you're going to pray for. It's what you're going to work for. It's what you're going to seek with your life. And if you don't pick God in love, you're going to pick something else. And it's probably going to be yourself. And, and that leads to selfishness. And that leads to more problems. Or you're going to give in to the desires of your heart that are, that are centered on, on what you want at the expense of somebody else. And to not choose love means you're going to choose something else that's going to wind up being hurtful and destructive. So you have to have an ideal. You have to pick something. And Jesus Christ says the greatest ideal is love. Start there and learn what it means to experience God's love more and more the rest of your life. And then learn what it means to, to let God love other people through you. I, that's one thing I am absolutely sure of. I'm 62 years old. I've had a lot more life than you have. I've had a lot, probably a lot more failures than you have. A lot more mistakes, a lot more struggles. But this much I can assure you of from my own experience. That according to the Christian message, God loves every one of you. And God believes and God can make you a more loving person. That's a great Christian hope. That's the great thing that we hold on to. Because it's real. And it can be something that guides and directs you for the rest of your life. And whether anybody else agrees with that about you or not doesn't matter. Because it's what Jesus taught. And it has been the reality for so many of us. All right, so that is what we want to say about love. So now I want to talk about the uniqueness and power of the Christian faith. And some of this is going to be uh, kind of a drawing together of some of the things we've already said. So just by way of introduction, let me say this. Uh, I think I have the word introduction there. Every religion advocates morality and positive human qualities. Every, every religion. And so we could say that, in some ways, all religions are quite similar. Now, you may know the differences between your religion and some other religion, but in some ways, there's a lot of similarity. Because all religions teach that we're supposed to be moral, good people, in some way or another. And every, every religion addresses the human weaknesses, the human failings. Uh, maybe they use different words. But as I already said to you before, the Buddhists do it one way, the Christians another, the Muslims another way, Hindus yet another way. But, but they all acknowledge that we are people that fail. And we hurt ourselves and we hurt other people. And every religion offers some kind of solution. What's the solution to this human problem? What's the hope that is there for us? Every religion offers a different kind of hope. So one of the requirements or one of the opportunities, I should say, of being here in the LAP program is to learn about other religions. And, and we hope that by the time you graduate, you will be able to say, oh, this religion has this assessment of the human race. This is their solution. This is the hope. And this one does, says this, and this one says that, and this one says that. That's, we call that education, for you to be more educated about the world. So tonight, is not, my assignment is not to talk about every religion in the world, but to talk about the Christian faith. And so now I'm going to just, again, narrowly focus on what is particularly unique about the Christian faith related to these things and the power of the Christian faith. That leads to the key unique emphasis, emphases of the Christian faith. First of all, oh, I guess I, I didn't put that... One, two, three, there. So if you have them in your guide. First of all, the creator God is a loving father who wants to have a good relationship with his creation. Now, by now, that should be reviewed, right? You heard me say that at the beginning of this lecture. 
But I want to underscore this as a unique characteristic. Because this concept of a loving father with whom we can have a relationship is simply not found in other religions. We're not criticizing other religions right now. We're simply trying to help you understand what's distinctive about the Christian faith. What, in my language, is what's special about it. Because as I told you already more than once, that this has become the most important relationship in my life. Frankly, I don't want a religion that doesn't have a loving father in it for myself. Because once I've tasted that love, I don't want to ever live without it. It's that powerful. It's that meaningful to me. And so it's one of the distinctive characteristics of the Christian faith that I treasure very deeply. Uh, number two, God, the Father revealed himself to humanity by becoming a human being. We call that the incarnation. God became human flesh in the form of Jesus to show us God's qualities. Again, I already said that to you earlier, but now I'm, the reason I'm repeating it is so that you can understand that this is a distinctive aspect. There's no other religion in the world that says God became a human being to show us who he is. And so when you're comparing religions as you do your education, this is one thing that deserves extra thought. What does it mean that, that, that Jesus is presented not as equal to Muhammad or Gautama or to uh, some of the other religious leaders or Moses in the Old Testament or some of the other great leaders. He's not just a wise teacher. He's actually God in human flesh. That's what the Bible claims. And that is at, at the core of one of the unique qualities or the uh, specialness of the Christian faith. The number three, Christianity also uniquely teaches that this God's Son died for humanity, as we've already talked about. We cannot fully understand how his death brought us forgiveness and salvation. I mean, I can explain it from the biblical point of view, but I'm talking about just existentially, humanly. It's, it's, it's really beyond, our, I think, our ability to really grasp. But the main point for tonight is that this is unique among religions. Of all the other great religions, Confucius did not die for the Chinese people. He never claimed to. He claimed to be what he was, a very wise man who looked at life and reflected on life and put down some of his thinking for us to reflect on so we have a wiser life. Muhammad Gandhi uh, was, I think, very astute, in my opinion, in understanding what it is that creates so much suffering in the world. And he had the ability to look inside of himself and to say, direct, Gautama uh, had, had a, an ability to say, to recognize that it's our desires, our desires for our things, for people, for possessions, that, that drive us to do things that poison the world and poison our relationships. And he was so astute about it that he created this meditation process to, to release ourselves from, from the power of, the, of that attraction and then to look through our middle eye to be, have wisdom to see how it's active in our lives. There's some real depth of understanding and wisdom that come out of that Buddhist tradition. But Buddha never claimed to be God. He never claimed to be God's son and Buddha didn't die for us or anybody. It's a, it's a different kind of contribution is my point. Only Christianity has its leader, claims that its leader is God's son who died for us. It's unique among all religions. Okay, and then, so that's the uniqueness. Now let's just talk about the power of the Christian faith for a few minutes. The power of the Christian faith. The cross has become a powerful symbol in the Christian faith. And here it's in the picture, the picture of the cross. What does the cross mean, do you think? What does the cross refer to? You know, one problem of asking 250 people a question 
is that many people answer and I can't hear anybody's answer. So how about one person raise your hand and tell me, what does the cross symbolize? Be brave. Yes, right there. Yes, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's the number one reason or the number one explanation for what the cross means. But what else does it mean? Anybody else have any other idea? What else does it symbolize? Yes. Uh, a different point of view from two men Yes. That's very insightful. The cross has, is also a symbol that shows that God has a different way of thinking than human beings. If you were God and you wanted to save the world, you would probably send, what would you send to the world to save the world? Spider-Man, Iron Man. <laughs> you would send a superhero, I'm sure, right? But God did, did not send a superhero like we see on television, the movies. He sent somebody to die. God thinks differently than we do. And yet, so surprisingly, so ironically, this symbol of death and humiliation has become the most powerful symbol in the world. There are over two billion Christians around the world who see in the cross the sign of God's love and God's victory over death. Because Christ didn't, Jesus Christ did not stay in the cross, he came back to life three days later. And so it's become this huge symbol for God thinks differently, God does differently than we expect. And so a very powerful symbol. But let me talk about this also in, uh, in another dimension, in addition to what we've already said, because these are very good answers. I want you to notice that there are two dimensions to a cross, right? What are the two dimensions? Okay. We, we have a name for that in English. You can use your finger to describe it. It's also called vertical and horizontal. Okay, let's talk about this because this is another way to think about uh, the meaning of the cross for the Christian faith. The vertical dimension can represent God becoming a human being. He, he comes, to, he humbles himself, he, he becomes incarnate which means he takes the flesh, the form of a human being, in order to be among us as Jesus was. And secondly, this vertical, di vertical dimension of the cross also symbolizes our relationship with God. And so many world religions emphasize not relationship with God, they emphasize what do you need to do to be saved. You need to meditate, you need to do get merit, you need to uh, do good works, you need to um, uh, contribute uh, something. There's all these things that you need to do, or in the positive sense, if it's not about salvation, it's just about making the world a better place. You need to promote peace, you need to be humble. These are many, many good things, but they're, they're not about our relationship with God. In the Christian faith, the vertical dimension as I've been saying tonight quite a bit, it represents that at the core of our spirituality is our relationship with our loving Father. That must be the ground. This cross is planted in the ground. It's firm in the ground. And so our relationship with God, our spirituality must be grounded in this kind of relationship with God that's based on grace, depends on faith, it focuses on what Christ did for us on this cross, trust in that, and ask God to fill us with his love. And so we can see this as, as just another way of talking about the conduit or the flow or the source coming from God, filling us, filling us, filling us, because that's the basis for our spirituality. But there's also a second dimension. I shouldn't say but, I should say and, there's a second dimension. And that's what we've been talking about. And so what do you think the horizontal dimension represents? If the, what? Uh, you started to answer. If the vertical dimension represents our relationship with God, 
The horizontal represents our relationship with one another. That's, look here. The horizontal is our relationship with each other here, in our country, in our world. That's, that's a very, very important part of the Christian faith. So this, I think it's another reason why the cross has been so helpful and powerful in the Christian experience. Because it reminds us we need to have a good relationship with God, but that is supposed to lead for it into a relationship with others. The love flow comes from God and extends to other people. All right, so that's the symbolism of the cross. Uh, and, and what I, the, the first two answers, I think, were most profound. All right? In terms of it represents Christ's death on the cross. That's the number one answer. And that it symbolizes that God thinks differently and does differently than we expect. But the answer I gave you was just to give you some more, another way to attach the content of the Christian message to a symbol. And that's why I added that additional one. And now number two. The power of the Christian faith is first of all seen in the cross, and the power of what Christ did for us, and the power of its impact on us to recognize the love of God and God's presence. But secondly, the Holy Spirit is God's presence with us. The Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, is, is God's presence with you to give you power to change your mind, to change your heart, and to do the good works that he called you to do. It's the Holy Spirit that gives you power to become a loving person. You can't do it in your own power. Now, all of you could go out and you could go on the street. If you see a poor person, you could give them 100 jets, 200 jets if you wanted to. Anybody can do that. You don't have to be religious to do something nice for somebody. But to really have love in your heart, to be transformed by a love that gives, but not to get, but just to give, that's God's kind of love. That's a special kind of love. That has to come from God. We don't have it naturally. And so when we read about the Holy Spirit, Simply think about the Holy Spirit this way. It's God's presence with you. Right, so in the Bible, we have different aspects of God. You've probably heard about that. You might have a question about something called the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But a very simple way to understand what we're talking about is simply, it's simply God, three ways of talking about how God is present in the world. God is present as the creator. God was present as the son. And now God is present here among us with this Holy Spirit. It's the same God. It's just three different ways of talking about three different aspects of the same God. So Christians, contrary to what some people believe, we don't believe there are three gods. Uh, we believe there's one God, but in three different aspects. And so that's really what the Holy Spirit is about. It's God's presence to give us power to become the kind of people that God's called us to be. So let's go to our conclusion now. Oh, okay, I already have this. Okay, now for our conclusion. I want to make a couple comments about postmodernism. First of all, I need to ask you, how many of you are familiar with the, the concept of postmodernism? Raise your hand. It's too soon in your education. Okay. Well, I think it's worth just commenting on because I think that you you know about it, but you don't know the name. Do you know how many know who Isaac Newton is? Some of you. Okay. All right. Isaac Newton, great scientist, helped us understand that the world operates by laws and, and, and there's certain systems that we can predict by scientific observation, mathematical formula. And so, I'll try not to bore you with this, but it really is relevant to your theology, to your thinking, is that some people believe that as a result, result of that, at least in the Western world, the Eastern world has its own origin for this, they believe that truth is something that you must just observe and learn. 
memorize, and do. And, and to some extent, that's true. And so in the Western world, the whole modern, it's called modern, but it really means from the Enlightenment period, Isaac Newton's time and later, there was a scientific mindset that said, anything you believe should be provable by science, and it should operate according to laws. And we can express these laws, and this is true, and that's not true. That's the Western way of thinking. In the Eastern way of thinking, especially in the Buddhist world, you have your Dhamma, which is a, uh, an explanation of what truth is, according to Gautama, and according to the Buddhist tradition, traditions. And you are taught to memorize them. If you grow up in the Buddhist tradition, you are taught to memorize them. You are taught to not question them. These are true, and you're to memorize them, and you're to do them, and don't think about them. Just believe it. That, that's kind of, it, it didn't come out of Western modernism, but there are some parallels. One is based on science, the other is based on religion, but it's the same idea that there are absolute truths that apply to everybody. We need some absolute truths in the world. Postmodernism has grown up in the last 50 years or so, principally out of the Western philosophical tradition. Don't be scared by these words, okay? Right? But the main idea is this, that your experience also matters. Your experience is another way for you to access truth. That's, that's postmodern. Post means after. What came after the idea that we can clearly say absolute truth for everybody is now this almost radical opposite emphasis, which we call subjectivism. This was objectivism. This is subjectivism. And now, and you, you probably don't even know it, but it's everywhere in the culture. If you, if you go on the internet, you, you listen to songs, you watch television, you, you listen to philosophies, everybody is talking about their truth, their experience, what they feel, and that really is all postmodernism. They don't know that, but it is. Why, why am I talking about this tonight when we're talking about what's so special about Christianity? Because this. Christianity, Christian faith, according to the Bible, believes in both what we call the modern approach and what you value as a postmodern approach. Both are important. Meaning, there are many spiritual truths that you can learn by reading about them and believing them and trusting them. But in the end, what is going to matter is what you experience. That's what's going to make a difference for your relationships, for your role as a friend, as a lover, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, as a citizen. It's what's really going on inside of you, in your heart, in your mind. Do you really know God? Do you love God? Do you know God's love? Have you been touched by God so that you actually have something inside of you that came from God that you now can offer to other people. That's the postmodern subjective emphasis. That's part of this, what I call the, the important dimension of the Christian Bible. For some of you, I know this is going to be hard to really grasp because as traditional Christians, you're just not used to thinking about religion in such existential, personal terms. But even if you don't know what I'm talking about, at least hear what I said. That that's the goal. That's where you still can grow. To move from tradition and ritual and your family tradition to something personal. That's, that's the postmodern purpose of the Christian Bible and faith. It's supposed to touch your heart. It's supposed to change your life from the inside out. And so what is the, finally, what is the relevance? Uh, well, okay, I guess I added these points too up here on the screen. The postmodern purpose of the Christian Bible and Christian faith is that readers would come to know, love, and serve God. And secondly, that readers would trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and follow up as Lord. And thirdly, that believers would seek to live by the power of love and love of the Holy Spirit. That's that existential, personal experience of the Christian faith. So finally, 
What is the relevance of the Christian faith for today? Number one, the Christian faith provides a way for anyone who believes in Jesus Christ to experience forgiveness from God for their sins. And they have a personal relationship with God that lasts forever. Number two, the Christian faith provides meaning and purpose for a young person who follows Christ. What is your meaning and purpose? To learn how to love God, to learn how to love yourselves, and to learn how to love other people with all of your being. The Christian faith, faith says that God has given each one of you a purpose in life, a contribution to make, good works to do, and that God will show you what to do if you want, if you will yield yourself, if you'll submit yourself and say, God, say to God, God, you're God, I'm not God. You're the creator, I'm the creation. You know what's best, I don't. I want to do your, your will. You say that to God, that will be the beginning of great changes for the better in your life. And then third, the Christian faith teaches believers how to experience God's power in their lives in life-changing ways. So that's the summary of what makes the Christian faith so special. And I hope that tonight you've gotten a, a lot, a lot of more clarity, a lot more information about the message and the heart and the uniqueness and the power of the Christian faith. And so what, what we're going to do now is we're going to give you an opportunity. This is, this is your short break. You get five minutes short break. And just to kind of stand around, go to the bathroom, get a drink, whatever. But then in five minutes, go to your small groups. You know what they are, right? Everybody, and go to your small groups. And they're, in your guide, you'll see three questions that you'll be discussing. And we'll probably give you about 15 minutes in your small group. And as soon as your group has a question, send somebody up to me, and I'll write it down, and we'll put it on the screen. And then we'll spend our last half an hour or so answering questions. Okay.